Hi, Garth Ennis here on Forbidden Planet TV to talk about my new horror book from Upshot, The Ribbon Queen, which is coming this summer with art by Jason Burroughs. Welcome to Forbidden Planet TV. Uh, I'm here with the one and only Garth Ennis. How are you doing, mate? Good, Andrew. How about you? Yeah, I get this funny feeling. It's almost like we've just seen each other, you know. So indelible was that last <laughs> conversation we had about like, battle action when you were on. Like it was only seconds ago. I know, yeah. right? Yeah. Mere minutes. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, you are the one who writes about the uh, the temporal the temporal stuff, mate, as we were just alluding to off camera. Um, but you're here to talk about another fantastic uh, book that you've got. You're publishing with Upshot this time around, right? Mm -hmm. That's and, right. Uh, and when's it, when, uh, before I reveal the title, when is it coming out? Uh, that will be in July. Yeah. So uh, it's just around the corner, really. Yeah, fantastic. So what can you tell me about The Ribbon Queen? Okay, so The Ribbon Queen is an eight-issue uh, series, a horror story written by me, art by my old chum, Jason Burroughs. Uh, with whom I've done a ton of material, most obviously 303, Wormwood, Crossed, and The Punisher. Um, and it's uh, it's a horror story, as I say. It's set in contemporary New York, uh, New York City, and it involves um, what might be called an, an ancient force of vengeance that, uh, that finds it's the latest work it has to do uh, within within the fair city in which I live. Yeah. Nice one. What was the what was the inspiration for you? Where did the idea come from? Um, it, it's actually it's possibly the idea I've had the longest in my life because um, when I was I, I have a clear memory of being a tiny kid and knocking over a glass and reaching out for the the pretty shiny shards of glass gleaming in the sunlight. And my dad immediately stopping me and saying, oh, don't do that, son. It'll cut you to ribbons. And I, I remember in that moment imagining a person turning into ribbons, not bloody gory ones, but kind of shining red satin ones that seem to drift up into the air and coil, uh, coil in the air above the person's head. And 50 years later, I've managed to turn that particular memory into, uh, yes, a, a slightly bloodier uh, character. But essentially, essentially what we're talking about, I, I suppose, is uh, is a twist on the notion of um, uh, of splatter horror. Yeah. Um, if if Crossed was a horde story, a yeah. zombie horde story, and a walk through hell was something maybe a bit more, a bit darker and more psychological, this is splatter. Um, like I think the best gory horror stories, there's actually surprisingly few instances of that happening in the story. It's just that when it does happen it's hopefully fairly memorable um this is where jason comes in because someone has to someone has to draw all these uh draw all, all this sort of ghastly goings on in uh intricate detail yeah. and he's the absolute king of that yeah yeah no he, i mean he really is his pedigree for doing that so amazing what what's your process when you because one of the one of the hallmarks of your work which is at the forefront in your horror work, but it, it's 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 there in a lot of other things. It's there in some of the, the World War Two violence we were talking about recently. It's there massively within aspects of Preacher. Um, where is it? What are you accessing when you're coming up with these with this really unusual imagery? Because mm. I think one of your great skills is is coming up with these horror vistas or in moments of personal horror that you haven't seen before, which is 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 why no doubt you keep working in in this genre. But where's that coming from within you and how are you accessing it? Well, I think what you just said there is key. Actually, it's trying to show people something they haven't seen before, yeah. either a twist on something familiar or something completely new. Um, partly, you just when, when you begin to imagine horrific imagery, the terms you're thinking of, the terms you're thinking in are really what would be likely to happen in this instance. If X, Y, and Z happens, 
what happens to what what is their effect on a person what is, what are we likely to see um that that i think is what is what drives a lot of it um you, what actually pops into my head is when alan moore talked about um reading the old uh mad magazine parodies of things like super duper man now they're making fun of superhero comics um but what alan sees in them in these parodies is the roots of the idea what would happen if you had someone strong enough to punch a human being through a wall what would the effect on on that human being be and of course what alan eventually gets out of that is miracle man yeah right on and the awful things that um Johnny Bates and uh, Mickey Moran do to each other, you know, in their superhuman forms. Uh, so, you know, the, the roots of this this stuff come from all over. For Alan, it was in this parody. For me, it's it's re- it, it is just really imagining the effect, the physical effects on the human form sometimes, and and how that can fit into the narrative and what the roots of that might be. At at one point we go back in time and we see the origin of this of the ribbon queen of this particularly horrific force uh back in prehistory uh and it 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 comes again from an instant an incident in which um particularly particular physical forces are visited on the human form uh, on one person in particular uh and that is what I think gives the thing its origin, gives the force its physical form. Yeah, that's that, that's mate. That's so interesting. Mm-hmm. I, I, of of those questions of of the, of have they always been there within your subconscious? The questions of like yeah, the 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 immortal kind of ever present multi generational evil. Is that something that you've had on your mind since you were a kid? Is it is it just a narrative device? What's the deal? Uh, in this instance, it isn't so so much uh, a, a lifelong thing. That's definitely where I got that particular piece of imagery yeah. from the story I told you about my, my dad and the glass. Um, this is more about the question of if there is a particular, if there is a particular form of cruelty and a particular form of evil, and it's gone unanswered. What would happen if there was an answer to it, and why? wouldn't that answer have been definitive in other words if someone was if someone was wielding a weapon of vengeance against a particular form of human cruelty why wouldn't they have wiped that cruelty out why wouldn't it have been decisive uh that that i suppose is um is where this one began i mean a, a lot of it comes down to what you're thinking about at the time if if i go back to crossed crossed came from some of my thoughts about the um, the absolute wrongdoing of the second Bush administration going unpunished, also the uh, the horror of the uh, the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans when oh, people yeah. were simply yeah. abandoned, yeah. and I began to think about if if there was a kind of a personification of that kind of wrongdoing and that kind of randomness and cruelty, um, if if there was a world. Uh, in which no one came to help anybody well what would it look like and I came up with the cross um this one the ribbon queen it's a lot more specific um it has to do with I suppose in broad terms uh cruelty towards woman man's inhumanity to woman um but it it does it does ask the question okay if there's something that can do that can make that right or if there's something that can at least avenge that why hasn't it had a decisive effect over the years uh, i mean going slightly off topic here uh, obviously what i want to avoid doing is simply creating yet another bloody superhero character with yeah. a specific power because then all you have is another superhero and what's the point of that yeah you right. you want to have something that fits more into the real world so that you can ask questions like, well, what would be, how would people respond in the real world if they were faced with something that forced them to admit uh, to, to the existence of the supernatural? Yeah. What would happen there in a city bureaucracy, for instance, if people had, if people were forced to try and cover up the actions of such a force? 
I, I think that's very interesting. I, I think that the, what fascinates me about the, the way you're looking at that and that being the, the, the Bush administration, the Katrina stuff being part of the inspiration is that, you know, one of the classic adages of, of, of Hollywood was always that, you know, in times of a great sort of personal strife um, and uh, lean times, uh, that fantasy becomes very popular. So, so, and fantasy is right. whatever fantasy is in that era, you know, so right. for example, in, in the, in the depression, it's uh, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, you know, this mm -hmm. idealized life of spontaneously singing and dancing in these beautiful New York apartments where every is, yes. is witty and sharp. Yeah. Yes, of uh, course. Um, just, yeah. just like at, at the moment when uh, over the past 10 years, life could not have been more uncertain in the social and political spheres in in uh, in Britain and the UK, fantasy is on the rise again in the shape of superhero movies, exactly. because the thought of a of a handsome man or beautiful woman who comes from the sky and saves you is an enormously attractive one. It's it's you know it's it's better than looking out the window or looking at your TV and seeing reality and all its horror and realizing you're somewhat powerless against it so of course people reach for fantasy i i just have such limited interest in it that i'm driven more to write the kind of stuff we're talking about and and that's exactly where i was going with this because i think what's interesting about the contemporary era unfettered by the the, the critical the, the constraints of society you know 80 years ago is that you yes you absolutely have all of that or the power of fantasy given the fact that we're all so powerless and the world is such an awful place on number by a number of metrics but the other thing it's it, our popular entertainment is also allowed to see it all the other way where everybody's collective sense of uh, sense of existential dread mm -hmm. like powers this huge boom in horror you know both literary horror you know and we publish a ton of literary horror at titan Mm -hmm. and uh and and on the screen you know and within comics and it would seem to me that you know there's there's a, there's a lot more there's been a real horror explosion in the last five or six years you only got to look at the success of blumhouse for example with that mm -hmm. really low budget you know or winning formula for cranking out you know often quite effective horror movies right but it's like it's like the duality of that fascinates me that yeah fantasy and you know, the upbeat and the the superhero paradigms embraced but so is taking a look at the darkest worst things we could possibly imagine they both mm. seem to be coming from the same place to me yeah uh, i mean uh, people are definitely ready to embrace horror um i i don't think there's ever been a time where it hasn't been a popular genre yeah uh, but at the moment obviously yes people are ready for a good old stare into the dark i don't think there's any doubt about that when we move away from from comics, um, what's have, what, have there been any particular horror movies or productions that you've enjoyed in the last decade or so that have stood um, out to you? Gosh, nothing really comes to mind. I mean, uh, probably the the movie that had the the most effect on me in this regard. It's not a horror film, but it's Sicario. Oh yeah, fuck it. yeah I get it completely. Yeah. Because it's an absolutely horrific view of the world. Yeah. Um, when you think about how things end up for the uh, for the Emily Blunt character, yeah. uh, with I mean, yes, she survives by the skin of her teeth, but I think um, uh, Benicio del Toro's character says something to her like, "You should go away from here. You should live somewhere else because this is a place of wolves now." Yeah. Uh, that resonated with me i remember seeing that and it came out in 2015 yeah. and i was quite jarred by that um it's hard to escape the conclusion that the what he calls the place of wolves <laughs> is getting bigger and bigger like that territory is expanding um as the world gets crazier and as people are, are prepared to prepared to live with worse and worse things um so that that had a a big effect on me um I, I can't really think of any horror movies or horror stories that that have really affected me recently um to, to get one that really got under my skin i mean you you'd have to go back to almost 20 years to the descent oh yeah oh, the descent yeah i get that I that's, would imagine that's which is a tremendous yeah. film actually yeah well it that, that's got so much of that 
over the overwhelming claustrophobia and you know the, the idea of being trapped and helpless you know it's to the max isn't it no, yes and, and also that you you can't really be a hundred percent reliant on your friends yeah right on. because there's you know there's a few uh secrets yeah. uh that that uh that are being held back there um and and you know when things go wrong it's it, it's on a it's on an interpersonal level uh, long before the nasty monster shows up yeah yeah yeah, I mean, I'm kind of loath to uh, to leave us parked here on this moment of stirring into the abyss of uh, <laughs> of, of entertainment archetypes generated by the dreadful place that we as a species are in, you know, yeah. personally and societally. But that is where I'm going to park it because Why uh, it not? feeds it. it feeds, exactly, you know, you can't have a happy ending all the time, mate. You know that more than anybody else. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and the happy ending and glorious ending is, of course, that some of that has been harnessed in the ribbon queen which is mm. you know, it's coming out in the in in the mid, in, in the summer of this year and can be ordered from the links attached to our conversation and uh, I, i'm really looking forward to reading this one mate Excellent. I, I, yeah. i'm just intrigued but i'm intrigued from the get-go by the genesis of it and your description of it yeah yeah well i'll, I'll tell you the i'll tell you how it starts how it starts is that there's a young uh a young Asian American detective on the NYPD called Amy Sun, who uh, has found that um, a young woman has been murdered, and one year earlier, uh, in well, a couple of years ago, in the summer of 2020, uh, an NYPD SWAT team rescued this woman from a serial killer, and it was, as is pointed out, uh, the police department's one PR win that year because of course with the Black Lives Matter protests and the police response to it of course they were not popular and now Amy is faced with the strong possibility that this young woman who's been murdered has fallen victim to the captain of that SWAT team and Amy is left wondering how uh, a Chinese American detective uh, with just a few years on the force, uh, is going to fare if she goes up against an officer of his standing. And into this per, uh, particularly sticky scenario comes the Ribbon Queen, and that's when all hell breaks loose. Brilliant, mate. Absolutely fantastic. So, uh, yeah, that leaves me champing at the bit to read it. And I'm sure the Garth Ennis faithful will feel the same way. Um, thanks very much for uh, sharing that process, that, for telling me about the book. And mm. as always, thanks for joining me, mate. Uh, absolute pleasure, Andrew. Cheers. I'll see you uh, soon. Yeah, always great to see you, brother. You take care of yourself. You too. Cheers, mate. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.